fire permit. Uh, they start repairing it. Guess what they don't, they don't have? A building permit. Why? Because when you show up, guess what they're doing? We're painting it, and we're changing a couple of bolts, even though you look up, and you know, kind of the bolts are getting changed out. So everyone in the United States, landscapers, electricians, welding guys, <coughs> fire escape guys, have been fixing fire escapes right under the radar and satisfying your, your violation that you wrote that says, scrape it, paint it. You need, a, you need a permit to paint the fire escape? No. So that's where we've all been hiding. I know, I've been hiding there. Everybody, nationwide, everybody's been hiding it. Why pay a couple of 200, 300 bucks? And why do I want a building inspector over my head? I want to get a paint job done, you know? Because I can beat anybody's price on a paint job, right? When you're doing apples for apples bidding with a full structural review versus a paint job, guess who wins all the time? So we're going to show you some of the tricks. That, that Channel 7 news report, uh, when it came out, one of the things that uh, came immediately on it was uh, in Boston. Anybody pulling a permit on any building now must have a current certificate on file. Okay, so that's some of the uh, things that you guys should be looking at in your cities. Try to start looking at your permits. Make sure your permits include that before you shut down any permits, see if the, the second means of egress is on the outside of the building, ask for a current certification. Number two, if you want to work with your fire departments, ask them in, during their smoke detector sign-off if there's any way they can add one more line to it. And that is, upon signing on the smoke detector, ask them for a copy of the current certification on that fire escape. Because if that smoke goes off, it usually goes off at night, what do you, what do you jump on in the middle of the night? Your first means of egress, the good set of stairs that everybody knows is good, or the the bad set of stairs that are sitting outside your window. All right? So, so industry standard guidelines, we're going to cover those today. And the last thing we're going to cover um, is the drawings of fire escapes. So if this fire escape solution, here's some examples of standard drawing fire escape solution, including ladders and spirals. Can you use ladders and spirals? Mm -hmm. On a case-by-case -case basis, and you're not allowed to, but on a case-by-case -case basis, when the mathematics doesn't work, and the only answer is a ladder or a spiral, and two people have to agree, the building department and the fire department have to agree for that building. Otherwise, we've got plenty of room. It's a full metal stairs to the ground, correct? Right? And then let's talk about this last page, and this is some industry standard uh, drawings. With today's technology, you guys want reports coming from engineers that basically is a one page that says corrosion, deflection, um, ice, I mean, rust jacking. Is that what you want, or do you want a report that includes some photographs in it? And with today's digital age, they don't have to make it pretty like this, but uh, everybody in here knows how to get nine, nine pictures per page, right? Using the wizard on their PC. Don't you think the engineer should be giving you the same type of reports? Not only fill out a report, they've got to give you some evidence so you can, at your office, look at it. And it's digital. Because a lot of you guys are starting to go digital. You don't want reports in hand, you know, because you have to hold it for three years. And if we, would it be great to have some of these reports already digitized so you can just store them in the, in the long-term storage? Well, we'll send you some examples. And then the last blue one. Anybody... Uh, Let's say, what's that mean? What's the renovator rule? EPA, as of 2010. Can't touch anything older than 1978 because it's presumed to have lead. So anybody know any fire escapes in their city that's older than 1978 and uh, presumed to have lead? Now, can, uh, can you put an open flame on lead? No. That's, you go get the course. It's uh, $189 or $200. It's a, week, it's a weekend course. In the morning, they make you wear the white suit. By the end of the day, they tell you how to collect chips. And one thing they say, no open flame. So when I weld a fire escape, uh, what is that? Legal or illegal? Fines of 35000 plus if I get caught. When you call the city, you say, hey, you guys are uh, going to find me in case I weld. And you go, Dude, we don't, we're not part of the EPA arm yet because we don't get any of that money. If we find you, you know, the $35,000 that comes to you. But... We're not the police force for them, but it's, there's fines, but you can't. But here's the beauty about fire escapes. 98% plus of all the fire escapes built in the United States are bolted and riveted connections. The welded ones fall apart. They're not properly maintained, they're not properly painted, and they just tear apart. So the good thing about the, this, uh, this welding law as it applies to the EPA, it doesn't apply because a majority of fire escapes are all bolted connections. The way you fix it, you break a bolt and put a new bolt in, remove the rust. So we're going to cover that all today. And uh, a lot of this information is free. We'll send you a packet uh, to basically start. We, we worked, uh, we did a class two weeks ago, three weeks ago with Westboro. And again, we used the models Framingham. And uh, we've done some tags uh, for them and we've done a confidence test for them. So you guys can take a look at that if you want to use I I just need your cards at the end of the day so I can get you stuff or I'll get it to you and then you can get it to everybody, okay? So let's, do, let's, let's talk about uh, Firescape uh, Awareness. Now, I'm gonna speak 
You agree or disagree? Now, don't forget, I've been in rooms with inspectors, fire marshals, housing inspectors. You don't have to agree with me, but this is a, just an industry standard conversation that has gone nationwide from here to Seattle, Chicago to Texas, down to Washington, D.C., and I, I enjoy when you uh, say yes or no. Now, I'm not a code guy. I'm not going to, well, the latest code said this <coughs> must be structurally sound, must get, be kept painted. It's in the fire codes. It's in the building code. I'm just going to show you where the gap was, where the missing information was that we put together, and then we freely give it out to you guys. You want to use it? Great. You, you want to do a, there's a couple of ways to do this. You, a lot of people say, hey, let the state, you know, come down and say that this is the rule for everybody. It's like sometimes pushing molasses because it's, it's just so busy with other things. The bastard child of egress is not at the, top of the, at the top of the list right now. But we've had a lot of success locally. A lot of guys want to do this as an ordinance or they just, they just say, hey, we want all our fire escapes to have tags or we want to use this <coughs> industry standard confidence, confidence test as a guide similar to the one that's online in Seattle. So I'm not telling you what to do here, but the law is very clear. It must be structurally sound, must be kept painted. There's been no information out there to tell a, a structural engineer how to properly inspect a fire escape. And there's no information out there to tell a vendor how to properly repair a fire escape. So it's like the Wild West. If you can do whatever you want, the cheapest thing you can do is show up with a bucket of paint from Home Depot and collect money. And if, they, you get, and if, you're, not, if you're not getting called to go see this thing because you know, there was no permit pulled on it, guess what? The check is cashed. So I'm going to show you a couple of things, and we'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly through. If it, throw, <coughs> throw paper at me, throw a question at me. The, you don't have to agree with everything I say, but let's, uh, we'll, we'll kick it around today. That was a live load test that we just did there, and this is that piece that I have on there that shows what happened on Marlboro. So I believe it was in 72 or 73. At the last second, everybody, everything fell away. The fireman is still alive today. The, the niece of this woman, which was eight years old at the time, survived. The woman did not. This changed the code back then in 73 where it was must, uh, the code uh, in Massachusetts it must be maintained at all times. Guess what happens with codes, which are still some out there in the United States? You must maintain your fire escape at all times. What's the rule of thought then? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right? So then they put the five-year rule back then. As soon as this occurred, and it's usually after a death, they put in a change. Now the five-year rule came in right after this. Some of you may or may not know that. But after she fell and died, they changed the code that now you must prove it every five years through a certification or a test. Okay? Now, the Station 9 fire, I just showed you the, the video that uh, came, so let me just get through this next slide. What are these? This is a live load test. This is when people basically are testing fire escapes. So let me give you a couple of incidents, um, uh, incidents that I'm going to be speaking through. First of all, we've got a couple of people here from the fire department, right? Uh, building department, ready? A couple of things that you guys may, they'll probably answer this question. Um, a lot of the gray-haired guys teaching the new guys in the fire department say to them during a lot of their classes, in case of fire, don't use the fire escape. So they didn't say too loud. You know why? Because nobody's watching these fire escapes. So the, a lot of these fire escapes have hurt a lot of firemen nationwide. So they rely on their own ladders. They rely on their own uh, trucks to basically fight fires because none of them trust these fire escapes. Because you know one thing that's missing? Um, and I'll ask the firemen that, that are here. If you guys got to a fire escape in the middle of the night, smoky, and all of a sudden on the fire escape, um, there was some sort of tag, either a white one, seven to 10 feet off the ground, and it had all this information. And you know white fire escapes are certified and low tested and or low tested. It had a yellow or a red. Red means that this dangling trails. Would this help you guys in the middle of the night fight that fire and make a decision, a snap decision right there as to whether to get on it right away or to go and wait for your truck to arrive and pull a ladder? Because in firefighting, minutes counts. Usually the person is dead through smoke inhalation, what, two to four minutes, two to five minutes into it? So if it takes two to four minutes to get a ladder off the truck, but now, some things have happened. It's not their fault that the fire escape is not being, they're just getting, they're trying to save their own lives because it's one thing to save a life in that fire. Uh, and this is what happens. You, you know, you're trying to save people. This is the worst case scenario for these guys. Not knowing whether what they have underneath their feet is safe. So, with a tagging system, which Seattle wants, they say, hey, we want to know, because it took 75 years to ignore fire escapes. You think we're going to fix it in, in 75 days? It's going to take three to five years for Seattle to catch up with all their fire escapes. But what they want, they want a tag on it. 
If it's no good, then leave a yellow or a red. If it's white, then leave those tags on there because you don't you certify them every five years. But it's immediately going to help the firemen. So if you can start the process of in your city of just identifying every fire escape and you want a tag on it, that's all you want. You don't want it certified yet, you'll get to that process in due time. Just give me a tag and it's either good, if it's no good, give me a yellow or a red. We'll walk you through some of those ideas. So I just identifying the fire escapes and throwing a tag, just like an elevator, that's half the battle. Because then you're going to chase the people that want to fix them and you're going to chase the people that don't want to fix them. So, low testing. Some of these are uh, New York photographs of when there was no AC. Guess how you got cool? You slept on the fire escape. Uh, in Cambridge, uh, down during the Hasty Puddings Parade, this is not the photograph, but one of the buildings that the college students live on, and guess what they did? They all came out to do what? Throw things down, yell and scream. They had some of the molding on one of these, very decorative. They had the cast iron molding and leaning up against it. Not, none of them was supposed to be out there, but they overloaded the fire escape, and guess what fell down to the ground? piece of cast iron molding. Came down like a rocket. Did it pierce anybody? No. Did it ricochet and hit the, hit the ground and hit some people? Oh yeah. Anybody say lottery ticket? That's what happened there. This right here happens every day. Sometimes you can't get to the, to the person through the front door. You have to go through the fire escape to get these people. And these guys are now performing what's called a live low test. Let's talk about a live low test. 100 pounds per square foot. What that means is, uh, and just so you guys know that the uh, fire escapes are safe to hold these guys on there, a live blow test, 100 pounds per square foot. A three by five square foot platform is 15 square feet times 100 pounds, 1,500 pounds. You want a low test? I have to go get 1,500 pounds of lead, sand, water, not people. Put it on there, load it with 40% of the load, watch it, take measurements, see that there's no deflection, videotape it, photograph it with engineer oversight, then put the remaining load on it, so for another uh, 20, min 20 minutes, it's about a half hour per platform, then all the treads and on and on. So it's a very, it's a lot of weight moving around. And you know what a pass looks like. You know what a, you know what a fail looks like? It's catastrophic. So how do you load these things? It's like being on a branch and sawing.